to your call you know when you are extremely devoted you will never backslide when you are extremely devoted there is no expiry date to it when you are extremely devoted you are not going to lose your first love when you are extremely devoted you are not going to become callous in the things that you do for the lord that is what true serving is all about there's no half hearted service no such thing as you serve god for a season and then you say oh i don't feel like it anymore i feel my season is over i've heard people say like that today you know after one year after six months or three months oh i feel my season is over in this church let me go to another church have you heard things like that if god calls you he plants you see extremely devoted serving god as the highest goal of one's life that is how your passion should be when you are called to serve the lord you should serve him as your highest goal nothing comes between you and god between you and your call everything else is secondary in exodus chapter 4 you will read that when moses left midian to go to egypt he brought his wife and his two sons and they came to egypt and so they were all together in egypt and moses started his ministry then in exodus chapter 18 you will read that moses father in law comes to visit him and the scripture says when the father in law came he brought zipora and the two boys who moses had sent away so between chapter 4 and chapter 18 somewhere in between moses had sent back his wife to go back to the father's house why we don't know right why did he send her back if i ask this question to an indian man they will say oh she was sent back because so that she can bring dowry from the from the girl's family back to the husband's house you know this remain a mystery or oh, i wouldn't say a mystery but i didn't even pay attention to that portion until one day the lord spoke to me something about how i should walk before him and a certain demand the lord put on my life and then he showed me moses life as an example he said he pointed these two scriptures chapter 4 and chapter 18 he said if you ever thought what happened in between why did moses send back his wife and his sons why one day the lord called moses up on the high mountain this was before he received all those 10 commandments and all the other revelations before that and the lord told him i want you to give me totally undivided you must not have any other attachment i want you all for me can you do that so without hesitation moses say yes lord then god told him send back your wife he placed his family on the altar of sacrifice just like similarly what abraham did and then the lord promise made a covenant with moses he said for the sacrifice that you make i covenant with you that your sons will receive an eternal heritage in the promised land and moses two sons receive a portion 
an inheritance in the land. See, when you're called to pay a high price, high call requires high price. For the amount of glory in which Moses walked, nothing wrong having a family. Not everybody is called like after Moses. But that was his special call. His special call. And that was required out of him. And because he was willing to pay that price, that is why his face shone like the sun. Because he was willing to pay the price. You know, many people today, they desire the anointing that Moses carried. They desire the glory in which Moses walked. But they are unwilling to pay the price Moses paid. They are unwilling. When you can't even leave for five minutes without your cell phones, you can't even pay that sacrifice. Mobile phones start ringing all over the place in a church service. For one hour, you cannot switch off your mobile phone. You can't part with it for even an hour. How can you then be in the glory for 40 days and 40 nights? Because even in that glory, you'll be thinking about your cell phone. You know, the closer you walk with God, the closer you have to lay down one by one by one. One by one by one. Until you are stripped bare naked. When you come and stand before God. Are you willing? You know, many years ago, I was ministering in Canada. Regina, Regina Canada. And one lady came up to me and she asked me, she said, please pray for me. Whatever God tells you, you must let me know. I said, all right, sister. So every now and then she will remind me, did you pray for me? I said, not yet. You must pray for me. Whatever God says, you have to tell me. I told her, that is very dangerous, you know. Because you may not like it. But she insisted, said, I don't care. I am willing to pay any price, whatever the demands. I said, all right, you ask for it. <laughs> so one afternoon, now, you know, normally I don't think about all these events, things, when I am in a, minister, in a conference, because my mind is more on the meetings and then getting a word from God than these other things. These other things I take note of and I will pray for them after the conference is over when I have the leisure. But that particular afternoon, I was not thinking about this woman. So the Lord visited me and he spoke to me about the meeting and what I should do or the word that I should preach. And after speaking, the Lord just lingered for a moment, looking at me with a very nice smile. At that moment, I remembered this woman. So I told the Lord, Lord, this woman wanted me to ask you what you think about her or what is your plan for her life. So the Lord told me, all right, this is what you should tell her, that I am going to strip her layer by layer by layer like how an onion is peeled one by one by one until see if you peel onion one by one by one what remains nothing <laughs> tell her that is this good news or bad news so of course this is not good news you know so I just kept quiet. 
And after a few days, or I think just two days before the conference ended, this lady came up to me. She said, did you pray for me? I said, before I can pray for you, the Lord himself spoke about you. Oh, she was so excited. She jumped up and down with great excitement. And they even, you know, take out a tape recorder to hear. Oh, you should have seen the look on her face. Such a great, joyful look on the face. So I said, look, sister, this is what the Lord said. You are like an onion. <laughs> she said, what, onion? I said, yes. He's going to peel you layer by layer by layer by layer. And so I just kept on saying, you know, layer by layer by layer by layer. And I said it slowly. Layer by layer by layer by layer. So then she asked me, till how long? <laughs> I said, until nothing remains. <laughs> she, at the last word, every smile on her face disappeared. And she was calm, she just looked at me, and she said, she muttered those words, thank you. I felt so bad, you know. I felt so bad for her. Anyway, furthermore, she happened to be my host, who invited me to the meeting. See? But she treated me very nicely, even though I gave her not too good word. So, several years passed by. Then I met her at another convention that I attended in St. Louis. And as soon as she saw me, she came running up to me. Of course, I remembered her. She comes to many of our conferences. She said, do you remember the word you gave me? I said, how can I forget? <laughs> Because never before and never after have I ever given to anybody another word about an onion. That was one and for all. So she said, you know, how amazingly your word came to pass. I have been stripped to the core bone until I'm stuck naked before God. Stripped. She lost everything. Even her husband. He died. Stuck naked. To the point of death. But then came a change in her life. Like a phoenix that will arise. Have you heard of the mythical phoenix? Like the phoenix that will arise from the fire and from the ashes. Reborn, remade, she became a new, better person. So, are you willing? We like the glory, but are we willing? If you read Exodus chapter 24, God called Moses to come up on the mount and wait. And he climbed up the mountain and he waited. For the first six days, God never spoke anything to him. He just waited on the mount. From morning till night, 24 hours, 7 days or 6 days. No visitation. No nothing. He waited and never came down from the mountain. Can you do that? On the seventh day, 
he heard the voice of God come up and from the seventh day till the fortieth day he beheld the Lord God of Israel face to face and God continuously spoke to him day and night not once twice two times forty days that's why the Bible says there arose not a prophet like Moses whom God knew face to face why because he's the only one in the entire history so far with whom God talked face to face for 40 long days continuously why he had that privilege because he was willing to pay the price he will we was willing to forgo everything the pleasures of a family Moses bo Moses boys were little boys you know you know how cherubic and handsome and fun to have little kids are he denied himself the pleasure of seeing his sons growing up he denied himself the pleasure of being served by a wonderful dutiful wife he denied himself of everything he became stuck naked emptied of everything peeled like an onion of everything when you become nothing then you become something if you try to make yourself a something you will become nothing but when you become nothing then you become something so Anna was extremely devoted to God for her God is the only thing that mattered in her life serving him was the only thing that mattered nothing else no other pleasures in life mattered anymore she only wanted God that is why when you make such an utter abandonment to God he takes you up because you cast yourself at his feet I have nobody Lord you are my only hope when you say like that to him and you really have nobody else he's your only hope he will look at you with great compassion and he will think in his heart if I don't help my daughter who is there for her she has nobody she has no father she has no mother she has no husband she's like an orphan here so let me do something for her you're totally abandoned to the Lord you know we read in the Bible I felt impressed in my spirit to tell you now the past 2000 years the church that the Lord Jesus Christ purchased with his blood has transformed from corruption to corruption instead of from glory to glory every other leader that God raises up has fallen to something or another right gold glory or woman either thing you know how much it has pained the heart of God to invest in the training of a man and then to see him fall how much it has pained his heart and even his present day 21st century church how is she is she any better than her predecessors? No. She's worse. She's in a terribly pathetic condition. Worse than any one of them in history. 
the Laodicean church. Worse of them all. Because she has everything, she doesn't need God now. So a small church prays very hard. And then when she prospers and she becomes big, she doesn't need God anymore. She doesn't pray anymore. Why do you, why need to pray when you when there are 1,000 members in your church? Why need to pray when there are 30,000 members in your church? You don't need to pray anymore. No need to pray, Lord, give us souls. Because there are too much. No need to pray, Lord, we need money for a missions plan. No need to pray that because you have tons of money. You don't know what to do. They are all invested in stocks and bonds. So the church has become like the Laodicean church. Doesn't need God anymore. So they depend on all their technology and all the lights and magic to create a service or programs minus God. Why do you need to pray? Don't need that anymore. This is the scenario. So God is now going to complete his purpose. The bride of Christ cannot be raptured, corrupted. She will be raptured, pure, holy, and beautiful. So the glory of God who is going to come out of the established church, just like how Ezekiel saw. He saw the glory of God depart from the temple and go to another place. Go where? Go among the highways and the byways where the common people are where the children are, where the youths are, where the women are, where there are godly pastors, hidden somewhere. No big name pastors, no name pastors, but real godly ones who seek after God with a passionate heart. The kabod of God moves over the glory of God moves over to them. So that remnant group becomes the final torch bearer to sweep the final glory. Because that final group will not touch the glory of God. It will not touch because they are simple minded people. See, look at Jael. You remember Jael? An ordinary housewife who did a great work by killing a great general. Did you read anywhere in the scripture that Jael went about telling everybody, I am the one who killed Jael, Sisera? But if Barak has done that, then he'll be parading all over Israel. Here goes Barak who killed Sisera. Right? And an entire choir would have gone just like what they did for David. Saul killed thousand. Ten thousand, right? But no one did such a thing for Jael. Why? Because she's just, who is she? A nobody. She's a nobody. But the nobody did a great exploit for God. Amen. Amen. This is the last day's company. The nobodies. Who is going to do great exploits for God. And you are that nobody. Amen. Amen. You are that nobody. Amen. You are God's last hope. Amen. 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 He is counting on you now. Amen. Because you are not going to touch the glory. Because you are hardly alive. So when Anna served God day and night fasting, 
angels used to come to minister to her when she would faint from fasting she she is a poor widow locked up in one room day and night she did not just fast the day or one meal or two meal the bible says she fasted day and night meaning 24 hours and for how long at least for 62 years and she never ate she fasted that was her call so whenever she would faint from fasting or she gets weak the angels come to minister to her similarly like how angels came to minister to elijah the prophet they brought food and water and that strengthened elijah to go on walking for 40 days and 40 nights as you read in first kings chapter 19 verses 5 to 8 so the angels enabled anna to fast continually for 62 years likewise the last days anna anointed woman now what should you do the anna anointed woman are going to serve god in true fasting and prayer for the last days remnant church to strength to stand strong against persecution so this is your prayer assignment what should you do what should you pray you are called to pray for the church to stand strong against persecution she prayed whole night just like how we read in luke chapter 6 was 12 that the lord jesus christ prayed the whole night so likewise the last days anna anointed woman will watch with the lord in all night prayer vigil i once read a story about a very poor widow poor old widow who was constantly praying lord I want to be of use to you. Lord, I want to be of use to you. I want to serve you. But this woman is an uneducated woman. She's she was uneducated. She was old and she was a widow and she had nobody to help her to go anywhere. But every day she prayed, "Lord, I want to serve you. I want to be used by you." One day she went to sleep. And when she went to sleep she just could not sleep so she got up and she sat on her bed thinking what shall i do now i can't sleep so she thought let me pray so she prayed for this she prayed for that she prayed for this she prayed for that from 12 midnight or 10 at night up to 6 in the morning she prayed And then the following day same thing happened she couldn't sleep so she got up and she began to pray the third day the same thing happened and it continued for 20 long years that became her call that became her call so she prayed lord i want to serve you so god said all right you can serve me by praying for my people you know what you do not know is god has many hidden intercessors all over the world praying for you someone somewhere a hidden saint living and gone to glory they are a portion stationed by god all over the world and their job is to pray for you that's their job because without prayer nothing can move nothing can work so in order for god to work in your life there must be prayer because we are not praying so god has called some people 
who are willing to pay the price to pray for you all the good things that's happening in your life they did not happen suddenly there was someone somewhere praying for you in the early years of dr blee graham i read this story about him he went to a certain city in the us for a 3 day crusade and the whole city turned to god so this is not uh, this is something very common in dr blee graham's ministry have you heard about that so when he was there after the last day of the meeting he came to his hotel room he knelt down and he lifted up his hands and gave thanks to god for the bountiful harvest as he was giving thanks to god he heard god's voice say all the fruit of your ministry here i am writing into the account of a widow in this city so dr graham was shocked he said lord what do you mean you are writing all the fruit and you are giving it to somebody else you lord you know i fasted the whole day i preached my heart out for 3 days and i waited patiently and prayed for everyone for their salvation how can you give all this fruit to which widow hole who is the widow lord the lord told him something he said there is a widow in this town who for the last 10 years prayed this prayer lord please send bligram to our town please send bligram to our town so that our town will get safe for 10 long years this poor widow nobody knows her in one small apartment day and night she prayed that prayer lord please send bligram to our town please send bligram to our town so that our town get can get safe so the lord told him you got this result because of her prayers so don't you think that she deserve all the fruit see somewhere someone has been appointed to pray for you that is the anna anointing they will watch the watch of the lord when you watch the watch of the lord you carry the burden of god in your heart and we read that anna was an intercessor a prophetic intercessor now look at jeremiah chapter 27 verse 18 but if they are prophets and if the word of the lord is with them let them now make intercession to the lord of hosts that the vessels which are left in the house of the lord in the house of the king of juda and at jerusalem do not go to babylon so look at the first part if you are a prophet if you have the word of god with you let them make intercession so which means all prophets are required to be intercessors so all prophets are required to be intercessors now what is intercession it in the original greek it means like this a prayer with a set meeting time meeting time meeting place or a meeting purpose you set a time to meet with god it also means to mediate or stand in for another person you are standing that's what we commonly call standing in the gap standing in the gap is not just simple intercession when you stand in the gap for someone else you are taking all that is of them upon your shoulder and you are praying through as if their problem is your problem that is a true intercessor a true intercessor never prays lord for them or for this they are a true intercessor always pray lord i it is me because you identify with the person for whom you are interceding and intercession also means 
to bring a petition to a king. A good example is found in the book of Esther, chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, where Esther brought a petition to a king. Now, as a prophetic intercessor, Anna listened to God and then prayed as directed. That is a prophetic intercessor. And an ordinary intercessor may have some prayer requests and they pray for certain needs that have been assigned to them. But a prophetic intercessor comes and waits on God. And then God tells you what you need to pray. How you need to pray. They hear from God. They get their directions from God. And then they pray as directed by God. A good example is found in Genesis chapter 18. Verses 19 to 32. Abraham interceded for Lot and his family. Based on what God told him. And you read in Ezekiel chapter 11. Verses 1 to 13, the prophet Ezekiel was taken in the spirit to the temple in Jerusalem. And what he saw with his eyes, he then began to make intercessions. So, what did Anna pray? How did she pray? Where was she during her intercessory ministry? She was in the temple. Now, what does the temple signify? A temple signifies a place for believers, for church. So, here we have, you are not a generalist intercessor. Just simply pray for anything. Now, you are specially called to only pray for the church. Only pray for believers. There are some intercessors who are called to pray for this nation or for that nation. But the Anna anointed person is called, set aside by God to pray for the church. See the church, as badly as how it may seem like now, but that's not how God sees. She is going to rise up like a phoenix in a great manner an exceedingly great army. That's what the Bible promises, right? In Ezekiel chapter 37 and the verse 7. So in order for her to rise up like that, God needs an army of intercessors to pray. To pray for the church. And there are many, many people called by God for that purpose. At my book table, I have a book written called the Maharishi of Mount Kailash. Now, Mount Kailash is a mountain in Tibet, which is considered very holy to the Hindu people, to the Buddhist people, and to another people group called the Jains, who live in India. And in this mountain, there lives a Christian saint, who this year will be about 423 years old. And he's still alive in perfect good health. You know, you must get the book to read his complete story. When he was 105 years old, when he felt that he was going to die, the Lord appeared to him and told him, because you have been so faithful for 75 years serving me, Say now I give you eternal life. You will remain on this earth till I come again. And your special work now is to pray for my church. So the Lord then put his hand into his heart, took out his mortal heart and gave him a new immortal heart. Say so you'll be alive till I come again. So his job or he's called now, is to make intercessions for the church, for the believers. Sometimes he's taken in the spirit to pray for believers, to pray for the people. Now he is just one among many. 
one among many whom God has kept secret all over the world to pray for you. God has his choice saints to pray for you. You know, when God called me to write the book, I asked the Lord a question. Why do you want me to write this book when this is not a new subject because small booklets of this subject is available in the market? The Lord told me, when you write this book, based on these little booklets that are in the market, I will open your spiritual eyes to see beyond what others have written, things that nobody knows about some other things that happen in their lives. And I want you to write this book and to cause an awareness of the existence of these secret saints because their time is coming for these hidden ones to come out and work together with my remnant church. See, that is why I keep on telling you, we must learn to work together with the spiritual realm. Because they are waiting to come and work together with us. And we need to learn how to cooperate. See, not only the Anna anointed woman will pray for the church, but you look at the word temple. The word temple has another meaning. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 19, we read that there is a temple in heaven. So when you are waiting on God, the Holy Spirit will come and take your spirit out and you will stand in the temple in heaven and make intercessions there. Now, turn your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now if you look at this scripture very carefully, it talks about two things. Now I will read one more time and then you will look closely. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense. Now, please underline the word, much incense. That he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints. Now, underline the word, prayers of all the saints. Now, there, there is a golden altar near the temple, which already contains all the prayers of the saints. Now, since all the prayers are already there, why was much more incense given to the angel to add to these prayers of the saints. Or the other question is, where did this other much incense come from? If the prayers of the saints are already incense in the golden altar, in the golden pot, where did this other incense come from? This other incense comes from this other company that are praying. See, when a person dies and we go to heaven, you just heard the sound of a bell? Okay. In India, we have a saying like this. When you speak something and a bell rings, it means good omen. So, somebody is agreeing to whatever I am saying now. <laughs> anyway. I lost my train of thoughts. <laughs> ah, okay. When a person dies and goes to heaven, they do not just sit by the rivers of Babylon with a harp in the hand and then sing all throughout heaven. 
They don't do that, you know. Heaven is a place full of activities. If you read the book of Revelation, it talks about, shows you so many activities that are taking place in heaven. Everyone in heaven is not singing and praising God all the time. Right? They're not doing that all the time. There is a specific time where they all gather to praise and worship God. And there are some angels specially appointed, specially created to worship and praise God all throughout eternity. But the redeemed saints, they have other works to do. There are so many other works to do in heaven. Among the many other works, one of the work is prayer and intercession. In 1995, I visited South Africa for the first time. And I don't know any history about South Africa. One afternoon, I went to the meeting. And uh, have you all heard of Dr. Gwen Shaw? It was her conference. She had invited me there. And she was speaking that afternoon. I was going to speak in the evening. So I was in the meeting and the worship was all going on. Great, wonderful worship. The glory of God was filling the entire room. As I was deeply immersed in worship, I heard the voice of the Lord say, lift up your head and look towards your right, towards your left. So I lifted up my head and looked towards the left part of the auditorium and the roof parted. And I looked into heaven. In one place in heaven that looked like a garden, there was a huge boulder. And there were two men kneeling down beside the two ends of the boulder. They knelt down, they held, they put their hands on the rock, and they put their face against their hands, and they were praying ardently for South Africa. I heard their prayer. Tears were rolling down their eyes and they prayed very ardently for South Africa. So as I was looking, I asked the Holy Spirit, who are they? So the Holy Spirit told me, the man on the left is Andrew Murray. The man on the right is John G. Lake. Now I have heard about these two men of God, but I never knew what is their connection to South Africa. But I heard them praying for South Africa. And so that vision that I saw is for my personal viewing pleasure, not for public information. So I keep it all locked up inside me. But after I saw the vision, the Lord told me, I want you to say this publicly. I said, Lord, I'll be dead. If I say this, they're going to crucify me and stone me in South Africa. The Lord said, say it. So that evening, in my meeting, I announced, I said, this is what I saw. As soon as I said that, everyone, about 300 of the people, lifted up their hands and they began to praise and worship God. And later on, they told me what was the connection of Andrew Murray and John G. Lake to South Africa. The large portion of their ministry, they spent in South Africa. And their work continues in heaven. You cannot ask the saints to pray for you. You can't do that. You cannot even talk to them. It's not allowed. That's spiritual law. Not allowed. But they have their assignments from the Holy Spirit. And they pray. Some are appointed for prayer. Some are appointed to come and help us to do the ministry. Just like how Moses and Elijah appeared to the Lord Jesus Christ and spoke to him about his ministry. Doesn't the Lord Jesus know about his ministry? He does, right? But then why did these two saints come? They talked to him. If you read Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 31, it says they spoke with him concerning the the passion and the persecution and the crucifixion that he was going to go through. They spoke with him and they encouraged the Lord. Don't worry, Lord. You can do it. They encouraged him, you know. 
See, no matter how glorious an angelic being can come and speak a word of comfort to you, it's nothing compared like a human coming to tell you, don't worry, I went through that path, you can also do it. Right? It's a world of a difference, you know. That is why God uses this just men made perfect to come and help us. Because they have gone through the same path like we have gone through. And they can identify with us. Amen? The time has now come to pray. Let's all stand up. Okay, now as pastors, well, may I have the worship team up here, please? So while the worship team is going to play some songs for us, as Pastor Sweet told you all earlier, please grab your chair and bring it to the back of this, the walls and stack them up very nicely. Can we do it very quickly, please?